We left off talking about the Russian Revolution at the point where they're in the midst of World War I. Tsar Nicholas is at the front lines. Alexandra is home, kind of holding down the front. But the government is becoming increasingly unpopular due to the hardship of the war, the economic crises that are left at home, and a feeling of distrust in the sense that Alexandra has this very unusual relationship with a sketchy character named Rasputin. In March of 1917, this all kind of comes to a head where women protest bread shortages, and that sets off a larger protest of 300,000 workers demanding that the monarchy step down. Ultimately, troops fire on the crowd, but then end up joining this revolution. The Tsar end up, ends up ab abdicating, and this revolutionary group sets up what we call Soviets, and the Tsar is placed under house arrest. Soviets are these councils of workers and soldiers, and they're you know, running the provisional government. Um, this new government continues the war against Germany, uh, which makes Germany, uh, you know, obviously not too happy. They were hoping that revolution would bring an end to the war. So the Germans, pictured here in their very distinctive German military helmets, send a revolutionary named Vladimir Lenin to Russia in April. Lenin's followers are called Bolsheviks, a word that means majority, and they start a second revolution promising peace and land and bread, and they ultimately win control of the government in November 1917. Now, Lenin had been in Switzerland uh, because he was a Marxist and he was spreading ideas. His older brother, in fact, had been hung for trying to kill Alexander III. And so Vladimir Lenin, really from the time he was a small child, you know, grew up um, really hating the government and hating the czar. And, you know, you probably would, too, in the sense that the czar is responsible for his brother's execution. Um, this notion of peace and land and bread is what Lenin referred to as his April Theses. He wanted the government overthrown, the war ended, Soviets were going to form the new government, peasants were going to acquire land, and the state would control all the banks and the factories. Ultimately, November, there's an almost bloodless coup. The Bolsheviks do take control. And Lenin's right-hand man, kind of leading the military arm, the Red Guard, if you will, is Leon Trotsky, pictured here. They take over and they move the capital to Moscow, and they make the Kremlin, also pictured here, their headquarters. There is a new flag. It is red with a hammer and a sickle to symbolize the union between workers and peasants. And at this point, the Bolsheviks start to be known as communist. Lenin is a Marxist, but true Marxism is not going to work given the fact that Russia doesn't have a lot of factory workers, doesn't have a lot of uh, proletariat workers. And so Lenin has to adapt these ideas to fit the condition, and he refers to this as the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, I don't know why there's a second slide there, sorry. Um, basically, if you remember, the idea of the proletariat revolting was something that comes out of Karl Marx's 1848 Communist Manifesto where Marx called upon factory workers to rise against the owners and take control. Again, Russia doesn't have much industry, so Lenin calls for this elite group to lead the revolution and set up what's called a dictatorship of the proletariat. Immediately, there is an armistice on all fronts, and the agreement with the Central Powers is this treaty of Brest-Litovsk uh, that, that takes place in December. Russia ends up having to give up a lot of territory, and at least for the time being, we have new countries, Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland.